for coming, everyone. My name is Angelica Santamaro, and I'm the director of the American Labor Museum Botto House National Landmark. It's such an honor to have everyone here tonight. I know it's been a pretty tough couple of months with all of their campaigning. We were supposed to have about 132 people. I think that some people may have just gone home after work and fallen asleep and, and, and didn't make it tonight. But you never know. They may come in sooner or later. But thank you for being here, and that's the most important thing. We are so happy this, this evening to be honoring our own trustee, the founder of the Health, Care, Health Professional and Allied Employees Union, and to me. And the current president of the HPAE, Deborah White. And the president of the, where are, oh here. And the president of the, uh, International Union of, oh, I don't have a book in front of me, of Allied Painters and Allied Trades, Jimmy Williams. And our volunteer at the American Labor Museum, a fellow teacher and member of the, is it the NJEA or the AFT? Jude, NJEA? Judith Hughes-Gray. Thank you so, so much. So before we have our flag salute, I just want to tell you some sad news. The bar is going to be closed during the award ceremony. But the good news is that the award ceremony usually goes quite quickly, so you'll be uh, up and having another drink and having some wonderful dessert in no time at all. We also have the silent auction here. Most of the merchandise is from our museum store at the American Labor Museum. So please take some time and uh, take a look. Uh, there is an ATM machine out there if you, if you need some cash. So now I'd like to introduce my beautiful granddaughter, Sophia Santamaro, who's going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So kindly stand. Thank you.
current president of the American Labor Museum and the former president of the Office and Professional Employees International Union, Michael Goodwin. By the way, uh, Jimmy, I think you're from uh, Maryland. The, the flag, uh, the song that was just so beautifully sung, uh, was written by Francis Scott Key, as you know, in Baltimore Harbor. And when you go down there, there's a, a little island right there, was it Fort, Fort Henry? And uh, it's a very interesting uh, trip. It didn't become our national anthem until when? Does anybody know? 1931. 19, it took them that long to, to figure that, to figure all that out. Well, uh, I'm here to join Angelica in uh, welcoming all of you and thanking you for your support of the museum. The museum is supported by volunteers like you who come and uh, participate in these events and it allows us to keep the museum going with the educational uh, services that are provided. Uh, Saul Stedden is pictured on your, on your program. It's hard to believe, many of us knew Saul very well, it's hard to believe that it's 42 years already? 42 years since the museum was established by Saul. And he had a vision. And his vision was that the museum would teach the younger people about the struggles of the past. And we celebrate the, I see the mayor of Patterson is here. Uh, we see, mayor. <laughs> uh, we celebrate the Patterson silk industry strike back in 1913, a grueling winter that they went through. And what those workers did was they sent a message. And the message was that we reject a 60-hour work week. We reject a six-day week. We, re work, we reject a 10-hour work day. And historians give credit to that particular strike that led to the five-day work week and a 40-hour work week that many of us enjoy today. But there are still many things that have to be done and many more messages that have to be sent. And we need the messengers to do that. And those messages are us, but also in the youth that's going to follow us. So I'd like to recommend to those of you who have the power in your unions uh, to consider enrolling your executive board and overrolling your staff. When I was international president of OPIU, that's what we did. We put the entire executive board in membership into the museum and the entire staff into membership. It's a nominal fee. Is it $15 a year or something? Very nominal fee, but it starts them to, to be introduced to what we're doing here and basically carrying the message to the younger workers. It's amazing what the young people don't know today. You know, like, this election was part of mystery, but I was in a coma the next morning, trying to figure out how the hell could this possibly be. But it's because of the misinformation and the disinformation. And we have an obligation to put out the right information about labor, its purposes, its struggles, and how we can do more for the working class of the United States of America. So I want to thank you all for being here. I hope you will take up my suggestion. You can also send delegations to visit the museum. <coughs> Evelyn Hershey is the educational director. She'll be happy to have more people come. You can bring groups. You can have your executive board meetings at the museum. We've got plenty of space to do that. And basically, to carry the message of labor and to make it stronger and better as we move along. Thank you all very much. The next person who's going to be coming up is, I told you before, ageless. I, the HPAE has celebrated the 50th anniversary of its founding this year. And in January, Evelyn and a couple of interns and I worked by creating an exhibit 
to honor the HPAE, and we had it the exhibit for four months up at the museum. And during the time that I was going through all of the photographs, I kept looking at this one picture that seemed like it was just taken in different times and different places, but the face was always the same, and it was yours, Barbara Rosen, who is the first vice president of the HPAE, and I invite you up to introduce these two wonderful women today. <laughs> HPE has our 50th anniversary this year. And I have to tell you that this story started with a newly graduated nurse with a reaction to her first day of work at Englewood Hospital. And anybody that knows the Antubi would have to know it was something like, what the heck is this? This isn't going to work. And that was the seed that was planted that grew into HPE. And to me, along with their colleagues, knew that they had deserved better working conditions and patients deserved better staffing. <clears throat> their initial campaign for union recognition in 1974 turned into a strike, then a contract, and followed by another strike. Very daring for the, the times. The union militancy of Anne and the Englewood nurses spread quickly across New Jersey inspiring nurses and other health professionals across the state to form their own unions. And today, HPA represents 15,000 nurses and healthcare workers across New Jersey. <laughs> so HPA, over the years, and under Anne's leadership, won groundbreaking contracts and legislation that required safe meal systems, being forced overtime, protected workers and patients from the worst, and we mean the worst, for-profit hospital mergers and buyouts that required public hosting of safe staffing. It retired in 2018 after 50 years of advocating for patients and healthcare workers and handed the baton over to Debbie Wang. Debbie, a nurse from Virtua Memorial, fearlessly stepped up to the plate and traded in her stethoscope for a megaphone with the determination to keep fighting for better working conditions and quality patient care. But Debbie couldn't ever be, have been prepared or predict the challenge that was ahead of her when the worst healthcare crisis since 1918 hit, the pandemic. Hospitals were literally a war zone. Patients and workers were dying and getting sick. And worse, the pandemic was in the hands of the Hospital Association. And I have to tell you, that was like the fox watching the hen house. Against the forces, okay, that wanted only to protect their image and the bottom line of their hospitals. But HPA left no stone unturned. And today we have the distinction of having filed the, and, and have received the most OSHA citations in the nation during the pandemic. Currently, Debbie is leading a coalition of healthcare workers in New Jersey in a very aggressive campaign called Code Red, demanding that safe staffing in hospitals through legislation that would mandate ratios. Because of Debbie's influence, we're going to let the safe staff and legislation garner the endorsement of the New Jersey Nurses Association, who are always opposed to this legislation. And not only that, they have become powerful supporters. <laughs> this campaign also includes ratios and contracts, and we're very proud that we have had several locals this year negotiate ratios in, in the contract. But the tough fight continues. And I have to remember that also Debbie and Ann, both as members of the AFT Executive Council, they weren't only fierce advocates for New Jersey and Pennsylvania, but they were fierce advocates, and Debbie still is, for the nation, okay? For 
workers in, in patients' rights. So it's really my pleasure to have worked with these two women over several years and to introduce Anne Toomey and Debbie Way. for not telling some of the stories that I knew. I was fearful that you would tell, and you just kept... I only had two minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I knew there was a reason for that. Uh, so, you know, it's... You know, this is a great honor because it's a great organization, the American Labor Museum, and it's so nice to see, you know, such good friends and be with good friends that... Uh, that support the same goals that we've been working our entire life for. Um, I, I'm not going to go into any kind of a speech because you don't need a speech. But what I'm going to say is that I felt that uh, as a nurse and as a union leader, which, uh, which were kind of like two crossing type of careers that I had at the same time, uh, that it was almost natural and we I felt we got more public support because we were in healthcare because the things that we were fighting for, the conditions that we were fighting for, the, the you know safe staffing, education, proper equipment, proper training for all patient safety issues. And the public got that. And the public supported us and we were very successful as a result. But I guess one of the other things that I want to most importantly say uh, is that when I uh, retired in, uh, from HBAE in 2018, uh, I was blessed and thankful, not just personally, but for the organization, to have someone who succeeded me, who has great skill, great vision, the energy and the competency to take over. Because it's it's one thing when you're fighting, you know, for something more in your life, but it's another thing to think that perhaps uh, it's 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 gonna just level off and it hasn't. Because we have Debbie White and the new team or not so new team in some cases, no offense for her. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, but but it but it, has shown the leadership, direction, enthusiasm, and has, uh, in, in my time, we went from the 250 nurses to about, I guess it's somewhere around four, four, 13,000, now it's up to 15,000. So that shows, it's a, certainly it's a clear mark of effectiveness, but uh, it is with my great gratitude that I turn the mic over now to my colleague, Debbie White, because she deserves the honor, the credit, uh, and for and my thanks for carrying out the legacy. Thanks. Thank you, Anne. And thank you, Barbara, for your kind words. You know, you don't know this, but you are the you keep the wheels going at HPAE. She's behind the scenes, constantly driving everything we do. So I want to give her a shout out, and I also want to thank you, Angelica. That display, which I am so sorry took me so long to get to because I live two hours away, it was phenomenal. It, I, we appreciate it and we loved it. It was great. Um, and Ann Toomey, without you, there would be no HPAE. We all know that. 44 years at what you did. You paved the way 
for me to slide into this role. And I have to tell you, Ann asked me several times if I would take over the reins. And I said, I'm sorry to say, I said no for years. No, I'm not doing that. It'd take too much of my time up. But I absolutely, absolutely love it. I love it. I love being an advocate for healthcare workers. Um, Anne told me when you take on this, this, this job, it is not really a job, it's a role. She was right, it's a role. And I know that my, what my role is after six years, we did just celebrate our 50 year convention, which, which was really great. But I also wanna say, I am honored, though I am honored to receive this award, I represent those 15,000 members um, at HPIE, and we are the largest healthcare union in the state of New Jersey. Um, but I am the face of a very powerful union. You know, it's our members that powered through that pandemic. It's our members that work, went to work every single day, terrified that they were gonna get sick and they were gonna die the same way their patients did, and that went to work unprotected. And that is why we got so many citations. So it is our members, our fellow healthcare workers, who I dedicate this award to, even though I'm accepting this award, they are they are truly HVAE behind, behind the award. Behind the face, they are the work. They do the work, they are there. We have some of them over here and we have some wonderful staff over here too. So I wanna thank all of you guys and I wanna dedicate this to you. Thank you. And we have um, our former vice president here, would you stand up, Bernie Gerard? Sophia, you know that Bima always says that we have to celebrate the everyday hero, the extraordinary accomplishments of ordinary people, right? You just met two extraordinary women who are in the field that you're pursuing. Sophia is in high school now and is studying MedQuest, is that correct? And loves it, so I see her uh, following your footsteps and they're very inspirational. So I have some contacts, if you have any questions, you just ask me. <laughs> thank you, Anne, and thank you, Debbie really, really heroes in my book. Um, you know, I'm really proud to say that I'm the daughter of a union painter. And to have someone here tonight from that union, leading that union, it's very, very close to my heart. And the person who I'm going to be introducing now, it has become a dear friend of mine. I met his wife for the first time and the first words out of my mouth were, I love your husband. <laughs> I don't know if that was the right thing to say, but I do, I do love you, Jimmy. He is so dedicated to the museum that whenever he comes for whatever reason, he'll make his own work. He'll look and he'll say, that needs to be plastered, that needs to be painted, that I mean, he can't do enough for us. Brothers and sisters, please put your hands together and welcome Jimmy Kearns, the design plaster and business rep for drywall finishers from local union number 1973. Didn't even know it existed, and shame on me being a labor guy. So I get a call, uh, Pat Kelleher and Andy, 
I'm Maria Foster. Okay, you gotta go up to the Lake Museum. There's a patch. And I believe there was an inspection. It was really hot. I don't do well with heat. <laughs> we, got the, we got the patch done barely, so it was like the worst patch I could have done in my life as a drywall finisher. <laughs> Terrible, but we got through it. And uh, it's an honor to go and help out however and whenever I can. Uh, it's a special place. We were talking about it at the earlier at the, uh, at the museum. You know, it's the, the past is what helps us fight for the future. And that brings me up to uh, James Jr., James Williams Jr., uh, president of IUPAT and Allied Trades. Um, we got a lot of stuff under that roof. It's not just the painters you know, the Allied Trades part, the drywall finishers, glazers, industrial painters. So there's a lot going on there. It's a lot to handle. And, uh, Jimmy walks the walk, talks the talk, and walks the walk. He's a true union leader, breathes it, lives it. And uh, we're honored to have him as our general president. Uh, honored to have him here today. Special, like I said, looking at the past and move forward. And I'd also like to congratulate everybody else that's being honored. So I'd like to introduce James Williams Jr. Thank you very much. The Sostetten Award presented to James A. Williams, Jr. by the American Labor Museum, Bottom House National Landmark, November 20th, 2024, for his notable contributions, which have improved the lives of working people, and for his tireless dedication to just policies and causes. Congratulations. Thank you. I, th I thought Jimmy did great. <laughs> but he, he was sweating. <laughs> um, now, look, honestly, um, I had the opportunity, Angelica and Mike, um, to tour the museum tonight for the first time, and, and for me it really hit home. Um, because you think about this time we live in right now, and you see what's really needed in, in, in our society, which is that deep education um, for, for people, and I, and I worry, like I, I just do. I'm a, I'm a father of three, and I worry about what world my kids are going to live in into the future, and I worry about oftentimes where, where is that sense of togetherness, that sense of solidarity, that sense of, you know, having each other's backs that, that the labor movement represents. And I, I just was really struck by the stories that um, Angelica told me that, that the House represents. And, and, it, and it really, I started thinking about my own kind of family, my own journey through the labor movement. Like, my great-grandfather was a charter member of my union back in 1918, 1919, you know? And I think about what those times must have been like. You know, we didn't even have the opportunity or, or the right to exist back then when my grandfather or great-grandfather joined our union. And I'm a fourth generation of, of, of my union, and I think of like, yeah, you know, sometimes we put our heads in the sand and we go, wow, it's going to be so hard, it's going to be so rough. Um, you know, these next four years could be so hard on all of us, and, and they will be, and they will be challenging. Um, but when you think of some of the challenges that people that came before us truly had, and that people that legitimately gave their lives for each other and a cause that was bigger than that, it really does help you see the future. And, it, and, and the value and the lesson that's learned in our history is something we have to teach the rest of this country. Because the labor movement is oftentimes what I call the most forgotten movement in this country, and that's by design, folks. And the work that you do, and the work that you guys do, 
and continuing to tell our story and our heritage is something that I think is truly amazing. Um, and, and on a personal note, you know, it, it's nice to be in New Jersey. It's nice to be around, you know, friends in, in the labor movement, especially in this kind of time period that we're in. But, but on a personal point, when I looked at the book and seen, you know, I'm, I'm just a high school graduate, a glazer by trade, which most of you probably don't even know what that means. I put glass in for a living. And I see names like John Sweeney, and I see names like Dolores Huerta, like Dolores Huerta, like from the United Farm Workers. And I, and I see names like Randy Weingarten and Mary Kay Henry, and I go, what the hell am I doing here? You know? But it definitely strikes home to me that, you know, our movement has some amazing leaders that came before us. And it, and it truly is a badge of honor to even be standing here tonight and be mentioned in the same vein as some amazing people and, and leaders that I look to for, for courage and I look to for conviction. So I just want to thank you two so much for tonight. Um, I, I know I'm going to be joining as a member, and I would say that anybody in here who has it, I think it would be a good idea to, to also join. So thank you all. mention someone who's very, very close to my heart, and that is our education director at the American Labor Museum, Evelyn Hershey. Uh, if you haven't toured the museum, please do yourself a favor. Please come and have Evelyn tell you the story. No one does it better. Love you, Evelyn, and I invite you up now to introduce our next honoree. Oh. There you are. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce Judith Hughes Gray, who is receiving a special recognition award tonight. Mrs. Gray has served as a volunteer tour guide or docent at the museum for many, many groups of school field trip visitors throughout the years. It is always exciting to introduce her to students as she is a Pattersonian by birth and from a beautiful and proud Italian-American family. Mrs. Gray is able to share firsthand stories about Patterson's working people, like her beloved mother, Jean Giovanna Diagostino Leproto, who was a proud member of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. One of my favorite stories that she shares with the students is about the blowing of the Patterson factory whistles in the early morning and the requirement that the workers be at their machines when the whistles blew or face being locked out and without pay for the day. Judith Hughes Gray attended college and became a teacher. Retired from full-time teaching for the past few years, she continues to share her talent as an educator at her former school, at her historical society in her hometown of Oakland, New Jersey, and at the American Labor Museum. Certainly, thousands of students have benefited from the gift of receiving lessons from Mrs. Gray. At the museum, we are very appreciative and grateful for Judith Hughes Gray's efforts on behalf of the American Labor Museum and honor her this evening with this special recognition award. Judith Hughes Gray. Judith 
Hughes Gray for outstanding dedication in support of the American Labor Museum. Well, obviously, it's a big thank you to my mentor, who has, um, who has shown me the way through the house. But I had been there before. And when I walked in, I was, I, my foot was taken away because I felt like I was in all my great aunts, you know, five sisters who lived in Patterson and Barry, um, people who were uh, in the factories, really. Like my grandpa was a tailor, but he opened up his tailor shop right by the falls. And there were five other ones, like Dr. Giacomo, uh, the stone cutter became the mining company man, and there was the barber, and the total pastry shop was another um, craftsman who, be, who opened up a place in Patterson. It was phenomenal. Oh, by the way, I do have two Irish names, but I'm fully Italian. Okay, just <laughs> let me you know. Um, and so my teaching experience then was was really brought into the the Bottle House. I just love. I work with the children. She already told you some of the things I tell them. But um, it's such a special place that if you haven't been there, you really have to go and take the educational tour around, not just have a meeting, you know, and learn about the Bottle House and the heritage of the many people who are there. My, my mom's uh, work smock for the Ladies International Garment is, is there. And when I was younger, when we went to Meyer Brothers, maybe some of you heard of Meyer Brothers and Patterson. But we had to sing the union song, look for the union label when we're looking at the clothes. We had to do that. So there's, there's so many things that are wonderful connections that I was able to experience with the Bottom House. So I thank you so much, and, uh, and thank you all for uh, for celebrating this wonderful uh, American Labor Museum and the labor people who are. I had uncles who were teamsters officials also. <laughs> so I had a whole different way of looking at the, the workers. And, and the wonderful contribution that they have made to, uh, to our America. Thank you. I love this night so much because we really honor people who are so well deserving of being recognized. Give them another round of applause. Before we go back to, to our drinking and eating, <laughs> I just have to do a few things. Um, I have to recognize a few people. So in addition to our president, Mike Goodwin, and our museum trustee, Ann Toomey, who we just honored, we have our board's second vice president, Tom Kelly, from IBDW 827. And we'll say Where are you, Tom? I'm so happy that he didn't wear the same dress as mine tonight. <laughs> um, our, uh, and our trustees, Pat Kelleher from, where are you, the plumbers? Okay, Pat. And is, did Tom leave? Did Tom Giblin leave? He did. Yeah. Oh, Tom Giblin was here. And Brendan Griffith? Is he here? And Orlando Riley from ATU. Thank you all for all the you to the museum. I really, really appreciate it, and we could not do half of what we do without you guys and women. And I know you've already met Evelyn Hershey, who makes up one third of the museum staff. And I'd like to introduce someone who's been on the phone with a lot of you during the past few weeks, our office manager who works 
so hard on this event and works so hard on everything. Again, I don't know what I would do without you, Robert. Robert Lindley, I love you. Beautiful, beautiful voice, and he could probably make a lot of money in radio or television or theater. But he chose, he chose, he chooses to stay with us, and I thank you so much, Robert. Um, and as you all know, a nonprofit organization could never function without volunteers. And you just had the opportunity to meet Judith Gray, one of our volunteers, and Joe LaFalce. But I'd also like to introduce Art Guarino, who happens to be Evelyn's husband and actually met Evelyn at the museum when he came for a tour and fell in love. Art, are you still here with us? And John Neely, who is our uh, union carpenter from New York, but he happens to live in the next town of North Elden, and he comes and does repairs for us all the time. John, do you want to stand up? I, I just have to share what John is working on right now because I'm very, very excited. So in 1908, when Pietro Baro built the, the house in which the museum is located, um, he had a, a, a backyard where he grew fruits and vegetables and herbs, and he built them, he grew them in like miniature greenhouses that are called cold frames. And from when I first started working there, over three decades ago, I always wanted to restore these cold frames. So I wrote a grant, and they didn't, wouldn't give us the funding. So I wrote another grant, and we got the funding. And John Mealy is building 13 cold frames that we're going to have at the American Labor Museum by the spring of 2025, and we're going to introduce a new curriculum on sustainability. What's old is new again. So I am so excited about that, and we're all invited to the unveiling when we unveil these beautiful cold frames. Bless you, John, for your wonderful, wonderful work that you're doing. I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to make a meal with all of the stuff that we're growing. Yeah? Um, and last but not least, I have to recognize the volunteers who work so hard at our Labor Day Parade. Our brothers and sisters from local 827 IBEW who grill and serve hot dogs and drinks to hundreds of marchers at our parade. Oh, you're so nice. Which is very unusual. You're coming out the door. It's the other guy. And. National Longshoremen's Association and the Longshoremen's Association Local 1804-1 and all of our sponsors. The Amalgamated Transit Union New Jersey State Joint Council, I introduced you to Orlando before, who's our trustee. The American Federation of Teachers New Jersey, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 827. The International Union of Painters and Allied Trades, District 21. 
New Jersey State Troopers NCO Association, and our former trustee, Chris Burgos, is sitting at the table his beautiful wife. And the Passaic County Education Associations, Sue Butterfield, President. I just want to tell you something about Sue and Tom and a few other people who are not here tonight, especially with the HPAE being present. I'm going to get emotional. Um, we are going to be, um, we're going to put a, a monument honoring all frontline workers in a park that's one block away from our museum and we're going to have it renamed. We're hoping we didn't get the official okay on it, but I'm going to announce it anyway. The Workers Park. And we're working on that. We have another meeting coming up in December, and we're getting funding for it, so you'll be hearing about this monument. And I'm very, very excited. And, and, and don't be afraid to contribute. And don't, yeah, that, that's the part that that we're going to be working on, yes. Yeah, so that's very, very exciting. So, again, thank you very much for your support of the museum, for being here this evening, and ordinarily, at this time, we have a gentleman by the name of Bennett Zorofsky, who is a labor lawyer, but Bennett is not feeling well this evening, so, uh, we usually stand and sing Solidarity Forever as he plays the guitar. And because I can't sing and my son can vouch for, for me, he, was, he never, ever, ever cried until I started singing. <laughs> so that tells you something about my singing voice. So instead of singing Solidarity Forever, I'd like you all to please stand and hold hands with the people next to you. And repeat the words after me. Solidarity for 